All right, a quick review of everything from coma to confusion. And neurologists like the term encephalopathy. I think in psychiatry, frequently delirium is um, the term that is used. Um, so we've been going through the neuroaxis, starting from muscle, working up to cortical. And there's some overlap, uh, obviously, here, but coma fits well in a cortical category. And so the four major um, categories of coma we want to divide patients into are supratentorial, infratentorial, metabolic, and psychogenic. All right, and so here's a nice uh, summary of these four major categories, and we can go through here kind of distinguishing features of each. So in a metabolic coma, and there are hundreds and hundreds of metabolic conditions that can cause confusion or coma, but the key thing is we're going to have a non-focal examination. Okay, so anytime you have an unresponsive or confused patient, non-focal exam, it's probably going to be a meta metabolic etiology. Infratentorial means brainstem cerebellum, okay, under the cerebellar tentorium. And so just like with the brainstem lesions we talked about in stroke, the key thing with brainstem is it will get ipsilateral cranial nerve deficits, contralateral motor or sensory deficits. So, for example, um, you know, patient has uncle herniation uh, compressing on the midbrain. Well, they'll have an ipsilateral third nerve palsy usually and a contralateral hemiplegia. Okay, so that tells us that the pressure is, is on the midbrain. In a supratentorial etiology, um, so we've got maybe a, a hemorrhage or something like that, we're going to have focal findings on the opposite side of the body, hemiplegia, if the patient is awake, a hemisensory loss, a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. If the patient is unresponsive, we may just find hyperreflexia on the opposite side of the body. Okay, and in a psychiatric or psychogenic coma, we'll have a non-focal exam, and usually we'll look for non-genuine findings, um, things that are just not uh, physiologic. Now, a number of uh, sort of uh, brainstem reflexes here can be helpful. When we do cold calorics or the oculocephalic reflex, moving the head back and forth, um, in a metabolic coma, and I'm going to show you a picture here in just a minute, um, when we put cold water in one ear, um, what happens is the eyes will just come slowly toward that ear, but we won't have the fast face, okay? Because why is someone confused or unresponsive in a metabolic process? You disturb the function of the cortical neurons, okay? And that's where the fast phase of nystagmus comes from. In an infratentorial lesion, like a brainstem lesion, and we do cold calorics, um, we may get some asymmetrical eye movements. If the MLF is affected, it may kind of look like an INO, or if we have individual cranial nerves affected, um, you know, like a six nerve, we may find that one eye doesn't A-B duct normally. In a supratentorial lesion, much like in metabolic coma, now the lesion is um, hemisphere, cortical, and so uh, we won't have the fast phase of the nystagmus, but the eyes will still go slowly towards the ear that is irrigated. And in a psychogenic coma, we'll have normal cold calorics. So uh, just remember here that... Um, if we put cold water in the left ear, the normal thing is that inhibits the opposite PPRF six nerve complex here on the right side. And that normally, the right PPRF six nerve complex wants to drive the eyes to the right. Six nerve talks to the lateral rectus, um, crossing pathway via the MLF, and the third nerve communicates with the medial rectus. So if we inhibit the right brain stem, okay, then the eyes... Um, the tone to push the eyes to the right is diminished, and now the opposite, not shown here, but the PPRF six nerve complex in the left pons is relatively overactive, okay? And so the eyes get pulled to the left, okay? That's here, the patient's looking at you, the eyes go to the left, okay? The frontal eye fields here in the left hemisphere try to overcome that, okay? So in a normal individual or in a psychogenic coma, this is intact, and so this now is going to try to override by activating the opposite PPRF6 complex, and the eyes come fast, um, in this case, to the right. They're going to go back. 
So in a normal patient, we get the slow phase towards the cold water, the fast phase away. And so if we have a metabolic process or a supratentorial coma, we lose the fast phase of the nystagmus. If we have an infratentorial lesion, uh, like let's say just because it's shown here in MLF, then we're not going to have, you know, the eye is not going to be able to look to the nose. Or if the sixth nerve is affected, we'll lose the AB duction. So cold calorics can be helpful. And of course, when someone's brain dead, um, they'll be absent cold caloric reflexes. The corneal reflex will be normal with everything except for an infratentorial um, lesion. Okay, so there, um, uh, for example, a pontine hemorrhage, because the corneal reflex is 5 in and bilateral 7 out. So if we have a pontine hemorrhage, that would be kind of a classic example where we would lose the corneal reflex. Pupils will be normal in a metabolic coma, and they'll usually be normal in the other causes, uh, unless in supratentorial we have uncle herniation, and then, we'll, of course, we'll get a third nerve palsy with dilated pupil. And with a pontine lesion, uh, probably the most important one here, which I'll show you in just a minute, is if we have a pontine hemorrhage, we'll get uh, pinpoint pupils, okay, but uh, a lesion in the midbrain, we might get a third nerve palsy, something like that. And then, of course, diagnostic testing for metabolic coma. You've got to do lots of things. Does the patient have hyponatremia or hypercalcemia or a urinary tract infection or some other sort of infection or a drug overdose? So we need to do a lot of testing. But again, that patient rolls into the emergency room confused, a non-focal exam, then you know the, the money really is going to be doing lots of metabolic blood and urine tests, um, drug overdose, things like that. Okay, for a supratentorial, infratentorial coma, we need neuroimaging. And so in an emergency room setting, we're going to quickly do a head CT. Uh, we may need to do an MRI scan as a more sensitive test um, on occasion. And in a psychogenic coma, all of our testing is normal. And in that case, an EEG can be helpful to show normal brainwave um, activity. So let's go through a few specific types of metabolic coma. Not that these are the most common, but just because they're commonly asked on board. So methanol poisoning. Um, so this is um, people that are trying to make their own alcohol, moonshine. And so the problem here is that methanol, as it gets converted to formaldehyde and formic acid, um, is very um, harmful um, to the brain and to the optic nerve. So the classic thing, board question here for methanol, is that these patients are confused or in a coma and have a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Okay, so you'd want to look for that. Remember, optic nerve involvement in methanol poisoning is classic. And so what you want to do is try to inhibit here the alcohol dehydrogenase to prevent breakdown into the harmful byproducts. So you can actually give patients alcohol um, or famipazole also inhibits the alcohol um, dehydrogenase. Now, carbon monoxide, um, most deaths are intentional, so um, suicide. Um, but, of course, this can happen due to smoke inhalation, poorly functioning heating systems. I've seen a number of these individuals live up in the mountain and just don't have good ventilation. So the problem here is carbon monoxide uh, poisoning leads to diffuse hypoxia because of its high affinity um, to... Uh, to the iron moiety of heme. So patients are confused, they usually have a headache, and if they get a prolonged, um, intense exposure, um, they're in a coma. Okay, the heart also is damaged uh, frequently by the hypoxemia as well. So we can diagnose this by uh, checking the level of carboxyhemoglobin, and treatment would include hyperbaric oxygen. Okay, and so the reason I'm bringing up these specific types of uh, metabolic coma is they have specific findings. So again, anion gap, metabolic acidosis, and methanol. And with carbon monoxide, we look for these bilateral ischemic hemorrhagic lesions in the globus pallidus, either on an MRI scan or at autopsy. That would um, you know, help to confirm the diagnosis. Now, hepatic encephalopathy is a little bit unique in terms of a metabolic um, cause because um, we have uh, cerebral edema often in the cortical area. So these are patients that have cirrhosis or acute liver failure. 
and the accumulation of ammonia leads to confusion, and the classic exam finding here is asterixis. So you have the patient hold their arms out, dorsiflex their wrists, and you get this kind of dramatic flapping movement. They can also have ataxia and nystagmus, so the cerebellum can be involved. They may have hyperreflexia. They're confused and frequently have a lot of um, psychiatric manifestations as well with personality change, anxiety. And so we can check this by um, assessing um, ammonia better if we do an arterial ammonia level. So again, normally here the ammonia produced by bacteria in the GI tract is broken down in the liver, but if we have cirrhosis or some other liver problem, then that ammonia then can um, affect the brain. And so if we do an MRI scan in these patients, we might, might, may find some of this um, cortical um, edema here. Now delirium tremens, um, mild alcohol withdrawal leads to anxiety, sweating, insomnia, tremor, tachycardia, nausea and vomiting. But we use the term delirium tremens when the patient goes on to have more uh, dramatic uh, autonomic activation uh, related to the alcohol withdrawal. So the three classic features here, these first two occur earlier, are hallucinations within the first 12 to 24 hours. These are often scary, spiders on the wall. Um, seizures can begin within six hours and, or up to 48 hours from the last drink of alcohol. And the classic thing here is it's usually a flurry of seizures, not just one, but a whole bunch, one right after another. Okay, and then later on, the withdrawal uh, delirium. So they're confused, and again, with a lot of autonomic activation, and usually fever uh, will be a part of that. Okay, so anytime we think about delirium tremens, we need to rule out other uh, drug use, especially cocaine, or maybe the patient's on benzodiazepines or opioids, so that can contribute or can cause something that looks very much like alcohol withdrawal. Treatment is supportive, so we want a patient in a quiet room. We'll right away just give them IV fluids with thiamine because of the alcohol use, and then benzodiazepines, usually long-acting ones like diazepam, um, to um, prevent the more intense withdrawal symptoms. All right, so that's uh, some specific metabolic causes. Supertentorial, um, to be in a coma from a supertentorial lesion, you need a mass effect. Um, like here, we see um, a subdural hematoma, an acute subdural hematoma, and it compresses the opposite hemisphere. So both hemispheres need to be involved um, to result in a supertentorial coma. So this patient... Um, you know, would most likely have some focal findings, right? A left hemiplegia because of more of the mass effect here on the right side. So the list is very long. Just to include a few, it could be stroke with edema and herniation, tumor, hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, abscess, could be lots of other things, okay? And so with lesions above the brainstem, we may see decorticate posturing with uh, flexed elbows and extended feet, Okay. Infratentorial often is seen uh, in someone who may have had a supratentorial coma, but then they have herniation and the pressure affects the uh, brainstem. And when that happens, um, the patient may go from decorticate to decerebrate posturing. <clears throat> All right, and so now we have arms and legs that are extended. This is a really bad sign if you see this. It usually indicates pressure down to the lower midbrain, upper pons. And the pathway involved there is the lateral vestibular spinal tract, a powerful extensor upper motor neuron pathway. So uh, probably the highest yield infratentorial lesion that would cause coma confusion would be a pontine hemorrhage. And so these patients have a bilateral Horner's syndrome. All the descending sympathetics are knocked out, so they have pinpoint pupils. Okay, remember crossed findings we would look for with any uh, brainstem lesion. And... Um, um, again, if we have, let's say, a supertentorial coma, um, lesions above the brainstem may cause this chain Stokes respiration. As the pressure gets transmitted down to the midbrain, they may have central neurogenic hyperventilation. And the most specific, probably the highest yield breathing pattern in coma is apneustic respirations. Um, again, classically a pontine hemorrhage. Patient takes in a deep breath, holds it, 
and then they exhale apnea, long apnea period, and then they take in another deep breath and hold it. Okay, this uh, ataxic or biots respirations is a really bad sign. There's shallow breaths, long apnea periods. This is an end stage um, breathing pattern where the pressure is transmitted down to the medulla and the primary respiratory centers. Now, psychogenic coma, um, we'd want to know if the history, if the patient has a history of psychopathology, if there's a recent stress. Occasionally, we'll see this in malingering where someone has secondary gain. And again, non-genuine findings on exam. And sometime we should do a lecture here on all of the non-genuine findings, but that can be very helpful. But your exam doesn't reveal any objective findings. Your blood tests, your brain scan, your EEG, all of that is going to be normal. Now let's go over the herniation syndromes um, quickly here. We already talked about uncle or transtentorial herniation, where we have here the uncus pushing on the, uh, the third nerve comes out right here in this intrapeduncular fossa. So we get an ipsilateral third nerve palsy, and the compression of the cerebral peduncle will give the patient a contralateral hemiplegia. So again, that's a crossed finding, tells you that the lesion um, has affected the midbrain. Occasionally, the entire contents of the midbrain can just be shifted over. And when that happens, it can push on the opposite cerebellar tentorium right here. And so in that case, the opposite cerebral peduncle can be compressed. Okay, And so if that happens, then the patient is going to have a hemiplegia contralateral to that. But notice then that would be a hemiplegia on the same side as the lesion. Okay. And so, again, a patient, let's say, has a left uncle herniation, um, like we see here. Um, but in this case, if it's Kernahan's notch opposite cerebral peduncle, they'll have an ipsilateral third nerve palsy and an ipsilateral hemiplegia. So this is a false localizing sign and can be very confusing um, in, unless you're um, familiar with that. Okay? But in either case, a third nerve palsy in a comatose patient is uncle herniation until proven otherwise. Now, if we have stretching of, um, you know, as part of the herniation, stretching of blood vessels that supply the brain stem, we can get these tiny little uh, hemorrhages. That's usually a really bad sign if we see that. And also, remember, the posterior cerebral artery wraps around um, here are these cerebral peduncles. So if we have uncle herniation, this may compress the posterior cerebral artery and the patient may have an occipital stroke because of that. Now, subfalcine herniation, here's the falcs, remember, which uh, separates the right and left hemisphere of the brain. And so here we can see a lot of edema and swelling, and the uncus, which is right underneath the falcs, gets shifted over. Okay, and remember, what is a midline blood vessel here? It's the anterior cerebral artery. So as that gets shifted over, we can have ischemia in the anterior cerebral artery distribution. And here you can see um, some ischemia right there in the anterior cerebral artery. Okay, so with uncle herniation, we might get a PCA stroke. With subfalcine herniation, we may get an anterior cerebral artery stroke. Okay, and then a herniation really not compatible um, here with life is a cerebellar tonsillar herniation. Here we can see a mass. And the cerebellar tonsils, you can just see getting pushed down through the foramen magnum. All right, then just quickly some different types of edema that we will see in a confused or comatose patient. Cytotoxic edema is, uh, cytotoxic edema is often due to hypoxia, but uh, can be due to um, toxins, but we usually see this in stroke. And so here we have fluid that accumulates inside um, damaged neurons and astrocytes. So here we have a patient with um, a sort of a posterior left MCA stroke. And so cytotoxic edema, we get a lot of swelling in the gray matter. And so notice how over here we can see a nice distinction between the gray matter and the white matter. We lose that distinction here. Um, and so the breakdown or a loss of ability to you know distinguish gray white matter distinction is quite uh, suggestive of a cytotoxic edema.
Now, vasogenic edema is often due to a mass, like a brain tumor, but can be seen in, in other conditions. And here we have the fluid accumulates in interstitial locations, uh, classically in the white matter. Notice sparing the cortex. So we've got a lot of white matter swelling right here. Okay, and this is due to um, damaged capillaries. Okay, so we get a lot of interstitial fluid here. Um, and so we also see, um, in this case, uh, ring enhancement of a lesion right here. And this is due to the formation of immature, leaky blood vessels um, around this mass. And so ring enhancing lesion um, suggests usually one of three things, a malignant brain tumor like a glioblastoma, a metastatic tumor, or an abscess. Now, interstitial edema, now we have interstitial fluid, but it accumulates in a periventricular location, and this is seen in hydrocephalus. Okay, so um, if we wonder, are the, you know, large ventricles, is this really significant or not? Well, if we're seeing interstitial edema, then it certainly is. Okay, something else worthwhile knowing about here is the Cushing's reflex. So we've got increased intracranial pressure. So this is uh, going to be a supratentorial mass. And this activates the hypothalam uh, hypothalamic sympathetic. So the blood pressure goes up. And uh, we've talked previously about the Cushing's reflex, where um, here the blood pressure goes up. Well, that activates the carotid sinus baroreceptors, which activates the parasympathetic system, and that lowers the heart rate. So what we see here in this Cushing's triad is high blood pressure, low pulse rate, okay, and we may see a Chain-Stokes uh, respiration pad breathing pattern um, along with that. So that's very concerning. If we have a patient who's confused or in a coma, high blood pressure, low pulse, then that's a neurologic emergency and suggests increased intracranial pressure. We need to do a brain scan right away. And so there would be a lot of things we could do in this setting, including permissive hypertension. Uh, you wouldn't want to acutely drop the blood pressure um, in that kind of situation. We can put the patient on a ventilator and hyperventilate them, which causes cerebral vasoconstriction to decrease intracranial pressure. Um, we usually will sedate the patient, put them in, into an induced coma if they're not already unresponsive. Mannitol can decrease serum osmotic pressure, and of course, depending on what's going on, if there's, it's a certain mass that may respond to neurosurgical intervention. All right, so what is persistent vegetative state? Three most common causes are cerebral anoxia, a really severe head trauma, and advanced dementia. And so here we have just diffuse cortical neuronal damage, but the lower areas of the brain stem that are involved in, you know, um, blood pressure, pulse, breathing, sleep-wake cycles, those are preserved, all right? So the patient has no meaningful interaction with the environment, but they may spontaneously open their eyes, uh, may smile, have some facial expressions, move their arms and legs, but it's never consistently does it relate to what's going on. You can't ask the patient to do something and have them follow commands. So they can't communicate, no voluntary volitional behavior or movements. Okay, so um, they don't have control over bowel and bladder. Again, they go through sleep-wake cycles, but they're not related to light and dark changes. And it's important to tell family members that there's no, they're not experiencing any pain or suffering. Unlike a comatose patient where the eyes are always um, closed, patients with per persistent vegetative state often have their eyes open and have some eye movements. And in a coma, patients don't go through sleep-wake cycles. Okay, finally, what's the criteria for brain death? The first point I couldn't overemphasize here. The cause is irreversible and known. And so if someone comes into the emergency room and they look like they're brain dead and you don't know what's going on, how long they've been like that, do not diagnose brain death because there are lots of things that can mimic brain death. Um, you know, hypothermia, uh, severe metabolic disturbances, overdose of medications. So we only diagnose brain death when we know what the cause is 
I mean, if you do a brain scan and the whole brain is herniated, well, then you've got your obvious cause and, and you know that the patient is brain dead. But um, until you have proven the cause, we're, we're not going to just do this quickly. It takes some time. So the neuroimaging needs to explain the brain death. So we do need to have a blood pressure systolic above 100 because severe hypotension can mimic brain death. The patient can't have any spontaneous uh, respirations at all. So if they're taking breaths above the ventilator, they're not brain dead. Okay, our neurologic examination will reveal absent brainstem reflexes. So no pupillary light reflex, corneal reflex is absent, cold caloric testing is absent, they don't have a gag response. We give them deep nail bed pressure or other painful stimuli, they don't move. Okay, and then we will sometimes go on and do apnea testing. And to do this, we pre-oxygenate, putting a catheter down to the level of the carina, deliver high flow oxygen, and then we turn the ventilator off and um, we need to see that there are no respirations for eight minutes, and then we need to document a certain rise in arterial CO2 that is above um, 60. So there are some more details, but that's kind of the big uh, principles in terms of brain death evaluation.